All right. Um, then calling the Finance Committee meeting of um, May 16 to order at 10 minutes after 2 p.m. And uh, we have uh, one set of very big um, things to handle that are um, a significant portion of our budget and all under the expert guidance of Guilford Boring. So it's Department of Public Works, um, which has actually um, multiple budgets and then the enterprise funds. And we will start with uh, Public Works, which begins on page uh, 66 of the book. And um, I don't know if you have any introductory remarks you want to start with. Someone needs to take minutes in. Okay. Um, I did it last. I did it Tuesday. I, I can do it, but you will have to, to check them. Sometimes I can't I think and write as fast as I need to. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Guilford. So thank you for having me. Um, thanks for the introduction. That was very kind. Um, there really isn't very many changes to any of the budgets under Public Works this year. Um, they're pretty much level services, as, as, as a way to say it. Um, we're not changing any services. We're not adding any services at this time. The only increases pretty much are to cover um, personnel costs, which are mandatory by um, our, our contractual is really what they are. So there really isn't that much. Um, I can talk a little bit about some of our challenges if you'd like. Um, or if, I, if you want to dive into the budget first, then I can talk about challenges at the end. It's up to you. Um, why don't we do it this way? Um, I think, and I'm going to ask my colleagues on the committee to explain because I think that um, I'm in a different position in having been involved with budget presentations previously that you've made. Um, you, uh, I th you did a really great presentation that was um, some months ago for the council explaining the intricacies of um, the department and its various pieces and how they fit together. And um, of course, the question for them, and I tried to point it out at the time, is that they have to start thinking about how that relates back to the budget, which is what this finance committee is trying to do. So um, I want to give time for my colleagues to ask questions um, that help them to understand those linkages. Um, but why don't we start, since you mentioned challenges and accomplishments, if there are things that sort of are holistic department as opposed to in the breakdown of the various divisions, um, to at least start with there, and of course that could pick up on administration issues too. So I actually wrote down a cheat sheet, so if I start wandering or I forget something, it'll be on the cheat sheet and hopefully you'll, what I said will jog your memory to understand what, what it is. Um, so for the department, our, we, one of our biggest challenges that is coming forward to us right now is our permits. Um, we're, we're controlled by several permits that are issued by mostly DEP and EPA. We have a bunch of smaller permits, but there's four main permits that we're going, we work under. The Water Management Act permits, the biggest one for the water department, and that's under review right now, and we should get a new Water Management Act permit probably in, I said 21, 22. The biggest changes that are gonna to come to the town are the fact that we're gonna have mandatory conservation requirements for water. We're going to have a lower unaccounted for water rate. We actually have to meter the water we produce and meter the water we sell, compare the two and make sure that they're within a certain percentage. Anything that's not metered that's outstanding is called unaccounted for water, and you have to figure out where that water went. And right now, it's allowed to be about 10%, and it's gonna probably drop to around 5%. So those two numbers can't differ by more than 5% soon. 
There's also going to be a change in what they consider the per capita use of water. Right now, DEP allows for about 100 gallons a day per person, and it's going to drop down to 60 gallons a day. This is all part of the DEP's conservation and new water management issues. Um, so where are, uh, as you say that, where are we now on the water use per person? We actually, in our, in our unaccounted for water, we're very good. We're below what we're supposed to be. It's right now 10. We're around, it depends per year, but we're around 8% unaccounted for water. And as far as use, we're probably around 85 to 90 gallons per person per day is really where we're at. So we're, we're in the... We're in the ball field we're supposed to be playing in now, but when the new requirements come, we'll have to ratchet down a bit and figure out how to, how to do that and account for those things. The, the other thing we have is the fact that our permit is going to re probably lower the amount of water we can take out of our sources. So our sources are actually registered. Each source has its own production registration. So Atkins Reservoir, you can produce uh, uh, 1.5 million gallons a day out of there. Um, and each, each one of them has their own what you can produce. But then you take it and they tell us how much we can use per day. So we may have six million gallons of water available from all our sources, but we're only allowed to use maybe four million gallons a day. And it's gonna go down a little bit. So it's a little bit of a adjustment and it's all geared towards you know, conserving more water for the environment and having more water for other users than just the people who use drinking water. So that's a big change in the world of water management, act, uh, water management in the state. Um, and it's being pushed by the Sustainable Water Management Initiative. So if you want to look up what's guiding this, it's called SWIMI, Sustainable Water Management Initiative. So that's the water permit. Wastewater has a permit too for the discharge. That's its big permit is what we're allowed to discharge to the Connecticut River once we treat it. That's under reviewed as well. And we're expecting to have lower limits on how much nitrogen we can discharge to the river and how much phosphorus we can discharge to the river. Um, and that's tied to the bigger issue of the Long Island Sound and to the algae and to the, those type of issues they're having down in the sound and the, use up, the usage of the oxygen and, and depletion of the oxygen in the sound. So we're, as we look at our world, we think we're just up here by ourselves, but in the wastewater world, they're saying, and in the water world, you're in a bigger environment. You have to do more for the overall environment. So those changes are coming to us. Um, for the wastewater, we know we have an old plant. Our plant is over, set, over 40 years old, and we have some things we need to upgrade. We've been holding off on those upgrades and planning for those upgrades because we're waiting for this permit. If this permit ratches us down our limits for discharge of nitrogen and phosphorus really, really low, we have to de design ch changes to our plant, which will be more extensive. If the changes to our permit is, are not as bad, the changes to the plant will not be as extensive. Um, so it's all controlled by the permit. We have two other big permits. One's the permit for the landfill. and. The landfill, even though it's closed, has a monitoring permit and then has a permit for operating of the transfer station. And we have to stay in compliance with both those permits. We're having some, we had a couple issues this year with the landfill. We're getting those under control, but the landfill permit will probably not change in the next four or five years. That's the cool thing about the budget. That one's not changing. Uh, the other one's all gonna change. <laughs> and then we have the new permit, which is the MS4, the stormwater permits. And we're just starting the first year of that permit. It's, probably, it's a 10-year permit. It may get extended longer, but it's meant to be for 10 years. And we have certain things we have to do over that 10-year period to bring our stormwater in, in, into compliance with regulations for the nation. And that permit's issue is maintained by EPA. It's not, it's, um, not controlled by DEP. DEP has some input into it, but EPA is managing that permit. So those are our four big permits, and they affect the, the broad spectrum of the whole department because almost everybody has to work to a permit and manage a permit and report something and, and so forth. Um, and then, so that brings up our second issue we have is um, expectations. We have these permits we have to manage, but then we have expectations of what people want. And if you look at our budget, the budget hasn't changed that much in 20 years. 30 years probably. It 
The changes you see are mostly in the personnel numbers and can be directly attributable to the fact that wages have gone up over that time period. Um, there has not been a really big influx of money into the budget except for one year we put $100,000 in the snow and ice. Um, and that was it. So as we think about doing things, and as we've done things, we've improved comfort stations, we've improved different facilities we have, we're getting ready to improve Groff Park. Ne at no time have we done this and then added more funds for maintenance for these facilities. Um, community field is being looked at now, how to rearrange community field, how to improve community field. One of the tasks that the consultant has is to give us an estimated cost of what we should be spending if we do this improvement, what should be our capital maintenance or our maintenance outlay to maintain this. Not a capital expense, but an annual maintenance number. And it's going to probably dwarf the budget for tree and grounds. So those are things that we've, we've always just worked within what we have. We've always made it work, and we've always come up with a way to do it. But I mean, people talk to you about the fields don't look the nicest. Why is this bathroom so cruddy looking? Why don't you fix this bathroom? We talk to you about our, seat, our, roof, our roof is leaking. Um, that, this is how this, these things come about, is we don't really have we haven't really planned as much as we should have and increased the amount of money for maintenance over time. And we put something off to fix what's the desperate thing at the moment and we move forward. Um, the third thing that's a challenge for us is personnel. We are at an all-time low for unemployment. We haven't seen unemployment this low in a long time. I was probably a, a kid the last time it was this low. And that's putting a big strain on us to find employees, as, as well as for our consultants and the contractors we hire to find employees. Employees are drying up in the area. We hire people who may not have all the qualifications they need. We train them up. We make them great employees. They enjoy being with us, and we get them really good. But then again, there's headhunters out there all the time. And you know, if you can make a little more someplace else and you're young, uh, you might take the, take the lead. Um, we have lost several employees. The environmental scientist was the last person to leave, and she went to another pseudo-municipal agency in another state, and she's making more, well more, probably twice what she's making now, was making with the town. Um, so we, we, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge across the entire town, not just in the DPW. Um, but there, would, there is an issue about how do you keep employees, how do you make their, their payments, and you give them enough to make it so they really like being here. Um, we have a lot of people who um, come here to work here because they live in the area, they have ties to the area, and they like to stay here. Um, but when the dollar starts being waved around and when costs keep going up, some of them will think to leave, and some have left and will continue to leave. So those are our big three challenges, and they're probably the big three challenges of most of the departments. Keeping, working within your permits, managing expectations and meeting the expectations we have, and then keeping our personnel so we can do all those things and not fall behind. Um, like I said, we lost the environmental scientist. Well, the environmental scientist work is now divided among three people right now. I'm doing part of it. Um, Amy Rizeki, my assistant, is doing a bigger part of it. And then there, the water and, and the wastewater division directors are doing parts of it as well. So it gets farmed out, and, it, and the extra work gets pushed on people who already have a full plate to do. So um, those are just things to think about. Um, and those are our challenges that we're managing, just so you know. Um, so I think that's about all I wanted to say on those issues. Yeah. And I'll just open it up to uh, questions. Let's uh, see if the questions, Lynn. Um, when you get licenses from DEP for uh, water, wastewater, and I guess solid waste are the three, right? Um, how long are those for? It depends. The, the permit we have to operate the transfer station landfill was issued to us and has not changed and will not change unless we change something about the landfill and they decide to, to modify our, our permit. Mm -hmm. Water and wastewater licenses are issued every so often and are set for um, review and then resubmission and up updating as they need to. Um, DEP used to have a, every five years, they did the Water Management Act permits that were renewed. 
Um, but we're, when I first started here in 2002, um, the permit was up for renewal then, and so now it's almost 20 years. Yeah. Um, a lot of things happen in those permits that, and things drive how they issue permits, but they're supposed to be renew, renewed and updated at least every couple of years. And this stormwater one from EPA is, was, the first time was five years, they extended it out to 10, and this one's gonna be a 10 year permit. Following up on that, yeah. do we have an estimate for the upgrade that might be required for uh, the wastewater treatment plant? Uh, no. So that's not in our present capital five-year plan? It's, in, um, in our, it's not in the capital five-year plan because water and wastewater is, has their separate sort of plans. Right. So in our separate plans on water and wastewater, we've been picking away the things we need to upgrade and we know we need to upgrade, but there's still this looming what does the permit require um, we probably have about four million dollars of work we're working on right now to upgrade the wastewater plant which should be obvious and uh, is that um, when we make purchases of capital nature in the enterprise funds they get charged back to that enterprise fund and uh, but then you have to build the revenue into the enterprise fund also which means that if there were a big expense that had to deal with the changes required for the wastewater treatment facility. And we um, authorized the debt. It would be debt for, to that enterprise fund, and um, it would have to be repaid from future uh, rates in that enterprise fund. Kathy. Yeah, just following up um, on both of those, uh, if you have a rough estimate of what it might cost, and as I understood you were saying, you, how much it needs to be upgraded, repaired, partly depends on what kind of permits requirements. Um, are there also estimates on, it, once that's financed, what that will do to our rates that need to be charged? So, you For know, the, how that translates to a rate increase, yeah. So based on the stuff we're upgrading right now, we have already done that. We've projected that into the rate system. So as you, we're, you're increasing rates 10, 10 cents this year on sewer, that builds in the work we're doing in the sewer plant right now and the upgrades we're doing right now. It does not project and we're trying to, as, as we get closer to being able to find a number, we'll start adding in some buffer so we start building our reserves in wastewater to offset any really, really large expense. So we haven't got there at the moment, and we we are, we'll, we'll, we will eventually build in the bigger demand, but we don't know. We, we haven't even got. I've, well, there's numbers being thrown around, but the numbers are just numbers, and they're not realistic to to base your rates to your customers on. Can I, can I just continue? I just can you build a rate increase before you have an expense and the expectation of an expense? You can, but we need to have we need to have a valid assumption of what why we're doing it, and we don't really have that good valid assumption yet. Does borrowing, even when you have a fund to take the money from, does that go against our debt ceiling? That depends on whether it's. Um outside the debt limit or not. Water and sewer are mostly outside the debt limit. Okay, thank you. Um, the question that I had, and then I, I just see it, Dorothy, I just, just say, but I'll just finish out my question is, um, is you're talking about water conservation and if you measure it in usage per person, is there any additional factor that gets built into the fact that we have agricultural uses in town, including agricultural uses for water? We do. So we, we, we're actually, a good way to answer that question is to say we do. Um, we have uh, all of our uses classified. So you have agricultural, residential, and commercial. And then the institutional ones are in there as well. So we know what class of use it is, and based on the class of use, we can actually try to differentiate the usage per capita differently. So we have very low, I mean, we, don't, we have maybe one meter for agricultural use. A bigger thing we have is institutional use. So 
there's so many people who live on campus, but there's so many people who come on campus to work every day, and that goes through one meter. So there's a methodology in the formulas that lets us analyze that and differentiate that differently than people who live in town. So we'll look at the residential people, and we'll look at the, at the apartments, and we'll, we can easily say, well, these are all people who live in town, and they're using it for personal consumption. Um, this is an institutional use. This is some personal consumption for the people who live on, on the campuses, but it's also mostly just business consumption. It's people who come to work, so that's treated differently. So we do break it apart, and we do track it by classification of which meter is which, and we try to make adjustments. And we're allowed to do that when we submit our reports every year. And I guess the other thing, just to point out to my colleagues, is that there was one other use we discovered on the select board a few years ago in discussion, and that is the uh, water usage by the um, university and colleges for um, uh, recreation fields. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Um, you know, we, we talked about this briefly at some other presentation when we were talking about the enterprise funds and water rates, that you could do differential water rates, that we don't now do them. <clears throat> um, not right now, but I'd like to see some way of assessing should we do them and what, what, it, what would it do if we had the, the large consumers, meaning like a UMass, um, what would, it, what would it do to the rates, residential rates for ho homeowners? We yeah. can do that. Yeah. Um, if you really want to, if you want to look before we give that information to you, look at the water rates or Google water rates from Northampton. Northampton went to a differential water rate recently, and they had a large outcry from their business community about the fact that they were getting charged more than the residential rates, and how they adjusted it so that. Even if you, um, so there's a high rate for residential and there's a high rate for um, commercial. And it's kind of balanced. They balanced it out so that it didn't really um, penalize one group versus the other. Um, and, and that's what we would have to do, and we'll have to figure that out. And could, if you didn't have it by commercial versus residential, but you had it by some quantum, you know, like using more that you regularly, so that you wouldn't necessarily hit um, a small business person with a higher rate, but you would hit a major bulk user with a higher rate, can, can you do that? Yes, and that's how, if you read about Northampton, that's how they did it too, because they had some small, comp small businesses that were being charged more than a residential customer, but they were using less water than the highest residential customer, and so they were adjusted and kind of came up with a methodology for meeting those needs, and yes, that can be done. Yeah, and I'm mainly focused on UMass, Amherst, you know, and, and it's because they're not necessarily paying us taxes for the rest of their land, so this is one service they're getting. You know, so I understand the implications of that, but just trying to think of how it would be targeted in a way that um, would be perceived as fair, and but mainly to know what the consequences would be of different choices. Yes. It'll be. Good. Good. When you mentioned four million, I wasn't sure whether you were saying that's what you were spending on current upgrades, or that's what you think the new facility would be. That that would be. I don't know where the four million goes. The four million is work. Oh, we're doing. are you uh, microphones? Oh, oh, sorry. I need clarification on the four million. Whether it's for ongoing repairs or whether that's an estimate for some future work. The four million is repairs we know we have to do right now, or working on doing right now. And then my second question is, um, I am interested to see how uh, New England and the uh, Met New York metropolitan area are working together. Most of the conservation is national. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about all kinds of regulations that were put in recently uh, being reversed. And um, just what is the situation? How? Are, how is New England working with the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area in this political time? You're talking about the wastewater permits mostly, I assume, so. And, and conservation. Okay. The, the, for mostly for the wastewater issue is, is the most of the issues that we're talking about with the New Jersey, or actually New York, and the Long Island Sound. 
Uh, New York actually went through a process and they made some major upgrades to their facilities, all their wastewater treatment facilities. They made, spent a large sum of money upgrading their wastewater treatment facilities. Um, the science shows that we in the Connecticut River Valley uh, are not that big of an input into the problems they were having in the Connecticut Sound. Um, so there's a lot of discussion going on and a lot of back and forth about, well, do we really need to go to the level and make the expenses that New York did to solve, solve a problem that really isn't as big in this area as New York's problem was? Um, New York was discharging directly at the head of the Long Island Sound, um, so whatever they put into the sound went down the whole sound. We discharged from the Connecticut River farther to the east, closer to the ocean. There's less of an impact from what we're discharging. We have less of an impact on what we're putting in as well. What we put in is far less than what New York was putting in in the Hudson River Valley and, and Hudson River and some, some of the smaller rivers in there. So um, that's one of the things that's holding up our, wa our wastewater permit is this discussion because EPA is controlling it and each state's trying to just have a little say in this as to, you know, hey, this, this really, you know, we're really not putting that much into this. You know, we shouldn't have to expend as much as this was done over here because there's a bigger, there was a bigger problem or bigger, the bigger source was coming from here. We're not that big a source. So that is going on and we talk a great deal. There's several consortiums that work together and talk about it. Um, the nitrogen and phosphorus issue is the biggest issue that's going on right now. Um, the issue with uh, drinking water has not been so much of a region-wide discussion. Drinking water has been more of a state discussion where um, state issues have been brought forward and mostly um, the eastern part of the state, which is very concerned about their water resources and the fact that some of their re water resources dry up in the summer where we stay, we stay pretty flush with water. Um, didn't mean that uh, that way, but uh, <laughs> we have lots, of, we tend to have more water than they do. So, so uh, um, that's driving, the eastern part of the state is driving the overall water picture in the state. And we're actually, the western parts are starting to push back a little bit that it's not really that fair because of the way the situation is set up. But um, there's a bit of a working relationship going on there as well. Yes. And so when I think about water, and I don't know if sewer, but I know we provide water to some parts of surrounding communities, and we charge them at rates similar or the same as we do our own community? With one exception, we treat all our water customers the same. And we serve water to, we have two customers in Hadley, we have some customers in Belchertown, and we have many customers in Pelham. Right. Okay, and what's the exception? The exception is, is when someone doesn't pay their water bill outside of Amherst, we actually get pretty, uh, we're gonna shut it off if you don't pay and it gets paid pretty quickly. In Amherst, it goes through another process, which I understand there's people who may not have paid their water bills for a while and it may be carried on a bigger debt, but it's usually the fact that the water customers who don't pay in Amherst also aren't paying property taxes and other things, and that's a bigger issue. Um, in the surrounding communities, we only worry about water and sewer, and we address the water and sewer issue and say, we're turning it off or else you're, if you don't pay. So that's the only difference between a customer in Amherst and a customer outside Amherst. Okay. Looking around to see if there's anything else. Um, uh, we, we seem to have jumped right to some of the enterprise funds, so, which is fine with me. I did, but I had a couple questions about them and then also on DPW more generally, so I don't know how you want to I think to what we want discussion. to do is we want to stick with the, um, where we really started because uh, of the fact that we got there with Guilford's guidance uh, and looking at some overarching challenges, questions. Um, I think the budget piece is we should try and stick with the order because we're going to try and go with the sections of the book. Okay, so I'll stick with these funds right now. Just if, when I'm looking at them, if you're um, holding a balance in the fund, is there a place, and maybe I can ask Sonia later, where I can see the balances? So do you carry, you know, 5%, 10%, 
in a balance or, or, or yeah. try to build up funds? Yeah. The goal right now is to have at least um, one quarter's worth of spending in our reserve fund. So if the budget's $2 million a year, we try to have half a million dollars in there. So that's just a number. I think we're in the million dollar range right now for both the uh, funds, the water and wastewater fund. Uh, the solid waste fund is a lot lower. It's, a, it's, our, it's our fund which is um, hurting the most. Um, but in water and wastewater, we try to have at least one quarter's worth of revenue in the reserve fund. And transportation is kind of in a different yep. bucket yep. to a certain extent. Um, since you were talking about sort of the overarching challenges you're facing in the department, I was curious to ask about one thing that you didn't mention, and that is uh, the uh, consequences for the administrative staff um, because of the decision for the last couple of years to try and get more money into the roads and sidewalk repair funds, whether managing all of those projects, how, if that's affecting other pieces of the work? Uh, we we kind of consider it all part of one, uh, with the, the road, trying to do more road and sidewalk work, it does kind of impact us a bit. The issue we want to try to get to and we're trying to move towards is making sure that we spend our winters and fall planning for the next year and have everything laid, laid out and ready to go. Um, we've had in the past years where we are given a project in the middle of the construction season. That's not what we want to do. Um, so we've been slowly changing how we approach projects. We're not really running or having problems managing them as far as long as we keep them in order. Uh, we do have one issue is we can't, we've been having some problems getting uh, interns to come in and work to help us in the field work when we're doing construction. Uh, we, we used to bring in two or three interns, other engineering students, our recent graduates from UMass, to just be field, uh, field engineers and oversee and watch what the contractor is doing and keep notes of what the contractor is doing. Uh, we haven't done that as much as in the past. That's the one place where we are falling behind. And that impacts the staff because the regular staff now has to go out and be a field engineer as well as being their normal job. Um, so that is one place we have a little bit of issue. Um, but overall, it doesn't have that much of an impact in it. Um, we, we, we definitely could use, a, if you want to have a lot more in-depth analysis of what people are proposing and asking questions about, uh, we, do, we would need to have more staff to help fund that or to have more money to have a consultant look at that. Um, but uh, right now, we, we're balancing it out pretty good, although it is a bit stressful every once in a while. That was a really bad answer, and I apologize for it. Just building on Andy's question, um, for the road work, you've said in the past that you also use contractors for some of the big projects. <clears throat> Can I see, when I'm looking at the budget, how much of the expense on roads is done by a contractor versus done by EPW staff? You cannot see it in the budget. If you wish to see that, we, pull, <coughs> we can pull out an expense report and you can see which contractor, how much we spent with each contractor. Because I was thinking that's partly the way that you can ease the stress if you're, you're trying to do more of it. The dollars are going for contractor rather than for in-house. You're not spreading your own staff time as thinly. Um, well, I was addressing the administrative staff. The administrative okay. staff doesn't okay. do much of the contracting. Sure. So you still got that side? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, we go to so many meetings, I get confused which one it was, but it may have been Paul or Dave that said, when it comes to roads, we really need to think about the fact that some of them just have to be redone all the way. And I know that we have this huge backlog in just kind of fixing and repaving. Um, what are the thoughts and plans for <clears throat> taking things down to the, to the dirt and building them up again? We do, we look at every road and we choose the appropriate repair method for it. West Bay Road is, uh, we're doing that one right now. We actually took that all the way down and ground it all up and repaved the whole thing. So we started from the ground up with that one. Um, we did that for two reasons. One, it needed it. And two, we were making some significant improvements on it. When you widen the road out and you're gonna add sidewalks and you're gonna add splitter islands for traffic calming and so forth, 
you do need to change the profile of the road horizontally and vertically, so you'll need to change to tear up the whole road and redo it. Um, East Pleasant Street, we're not doing that much. Um, we added the bike, I mean the bus pull-offs, not the bike lanes, we added the bus pull-offs, but the road was wide enough and in good enough condition that we could just mill it and overlay it, so that's all we're doing. So the main construction was bus pull-offs. Milling and overlay is the road, road repair technique. So you have to combine some, you have to use different methods and so forth. Yeah, sure. One of the challenges you mentioned is expecting, um, managing expectations, and, it, and it's tied to your objective of order, um, implementing a new work order system. And I was wondering if you've already identified um, a new work order system or what's being done about that. Uh, yes, we did, it. we did bring in a new work order system. It's called Dude Solutions um, by Dude Industries. They're out of North Carolina. Um, so uh, it's kind of a neat little system. Uh, we're breaking it in. We're getting it going. The biggest issue we're having right now is, um, is uh, we have some employees who aren't up to speed on the digital, digitally putting things in and digitally entering things. Um, so we're getting those people up to speed and uh, moving it along a little better. So what, how, the way the system works now is you submit a request for something to us, either in writing, an email, a letter. If you do it in C-click fix, uh, those things are taken, and then a work order is programmed into Dude Solutions, our Dude program, and then a Dude work order is sent to the person in charge, and then he goes out and does it. Um, sometimes it doesn't get back for three or four days or maybe a week that he actually did it, and that's the shortcoming we have right now. So then there's no feedback then that something was done. There's also no feedback in when something gets put into a bigger project because we have, we, we're trying to figure out how best to do those. So sometimes we'll get a whole lot of stuff people want. Um, people want something really, really big done and it's not a maintenance issue, it's a project issue. Um, and then feeding that back in as a project is a, we're trying to still figure that one out. And uh, is there a process to communicate back to the people where what's going on in this solution, Dude Solution? Dude Solutions feed, feeds back into the office, and the office staff member feeds back out in the way it was submitted to us. So if you do it by C-Click Fix, it gets documented on C-Click Fix. If you do it with an email, it gets sent back in an email. And that is a little rough, too, right now, but that's how it's yeah. supposed to work. Yeah, I, I guess our other related observation, but I don't want to discuss it because it's not really a budget issue, so I'll just say it and real quick, is that um, is we've been out in the community and all of us were involved in campaigns. I think one of the frustrations that we keep hearing from people is they really want to know where their street is on the repair order list and when they might expect to see something done to their street that they've been unhappy with. And I know that this is a, an ongoing challenge and something that is hard for you to deal with in the same way, but uh, you know, it, it is sort of this ongoing um, friction tension that we've observed. The easiest way to explain that is, is look at how they're rated. And it, the, the ones that, we, we put together the five-year plan, and yes, the five-year plan doesn't hold well to get, hold very well together, although year one and two of the last five-year plan is working out okay. Um, what happens is that something will happen to a road that wasn't expected or wasn't seen when they did the survey, and it'll move a road farther up. Or um, what will happen is, is money, the cost of that repair will go up. So the easiest way to explain to your constituents is, is, yes, the road was rated, this is the rating, and these are the roads that are worse than you are, and these are the roads better than you are. Um, and that's kind of the driver as we look at that, and we try to spread money out with minor roads and major roads. So that's how that is, works. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just, I had a question on that five-year plan, because miraculously one day it appeared in my inmate in my inbox, because someone had asked for it, they got it, and they sent it to me. So what I noticed, it was dated uh, December uh, 2017. 
um, the one that I guess the select board had requested. So yes. it was part, and it goes out through 2019. So you wouldn't, is there, does that get, even that document, if it got updated, so it was a rolling five-year plan, so what didn't happen in, if, when 2019 ends and the things that are on the list didn't happen, people know it, but if they knew they rolled over to the next year, so this kind of document is actually a pretty useful document, I think. It, it is, but it, it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually, just because you make it doesn't mean it actually is real. <laughs> it doesn't mean it actually functions the way you just described. Okay. Something may not get done in one year, and it actually may get rolled back two, three years. Okay. Um, so it's not uh, it's not directly proportional, or directly related where it is. It's a it's a lot it's a lot like the transportation improvement plan the state has for the Pioneer Valley. Um, they lock in one year, and then years two, three, four, and five can actually totally flip depending on what's going on. Um, so it's, it's hard to tell somebody that, and, and people, I know people have their smartphone and can get instantaneous updates on football scores and baseball scores and find out where your, your team is or where your team is projected to be if they do this or that or the other. Um, you can't, it's, it's very hard to do that with roadways unless there's a, a good deal more money and resources put into it, and we haven't, we'd have to put a lot more into it. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I think that it's sort of always important to remember, and this is just from experience that I've gained over the years, is that um, what happens to other roads doesn't always happen at predictable rates, and it may make a decision as to a road that was farther down the list important to move up higher on the list more quickly because the cost consequence or safety consequence of not addressing it may be greater if you don't get to it more quickly, but that tends to shuffle the order so that the plan never can work quite as a plan would where you take things in order for that reason. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Um, uh, sociality. You oh, no. Do you, no, I just can say, but it's still a tracking mechanism. You know, it's similar what I'm seeing. Some of the things in this budget are have been rescheduled, so you can see done, 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 rescheduled. I, it's it's just a useful uh, to go back and take a look at it. So I agree that it's going to keep moving. Yeah. This might be more for the town manager question, and it has been asked, I think, in different forums, different ways, but. What I'm still struggling with is we're looking at different components of the budget in isolation, right? And how are we making these decisions? We have limited funds, so just broadly speaking, there are capital expenses, there is conservation, you know, how much land, how much are we putting in to con conserve more land? And then there are these infrastructural maintenance questions. So are we building more than we are keeping for maintenance and then for the people? Or are we, you know, how much are we conserving? Do we need to put in more money for more conservation? So I'm not sure how we are making these decisions of where we are putting in money and how much and over what period of time. So I think that um, the message I have, since I've been here, we've been putting more money into maintenance, um, specifically roads. We've really focused on roads and this year more on sidewalks. Um, and the philosophy has been take care of what we have before we start building new. There's a lot of demand for new roads and things like that. And I think one of the, one of the things we've been waiting to do and DPW has been eager to do is to do a presentation to the council about road, how roads, road maintenance. And um, one of the things that is educational about that is that you may have a road that's in worse condition, but if you don't, you may have road A that's in really bad condition, but if you don't do road B, this year it's going to be three times as much the next year. So they make the their engineers may make the decision we're going to do road B this year, so it doesn't become such a terrible thing. And there's hard choices. There's not enough money to do all the things that they want to do. They they hear about the complaints on roads. In terms of um, purchasing land, I think uh, the assistant town manager has talked about throttling back any kind. Of, I think the the sense from the council is that we've sort of done enough conservation, buying conservation land. We have to start looking at different ways of, 
uh, investing our funds, and whether that's in affordable housing, um, but there, there are hard choices that you're gonna be making, and I think the whole council's activity has been revolving around our, our capital inf infrastructure, meaning our, our, the buildings that we need and then taking care of the buildings that we have. I hope, I'm not sure if that answers your question or somewhat. Yeah. It acknowledges it, but without <laughs> answering yeah. what we're It's complicated, I was that There's actually was a point later where I was gonna make a similar point, but I'm gonna save it. What I wanna do is get back to where we were and just go through budget and see if there are budget questions on, um, anything else related to public works administration um, and uh, the next section that was in there is um, in the budget book that follows on page 71 is highway and whether there's anything under highway. So I wanted to just sort of open up those two areas and make sure that people get a chance to ask. Otherwise we'll move on to uh, snow and ice and add that too. Um, when I when I scroll back to the beginning, so it's on page 70, there's a big jump in capital appropriations from 40,000 to 270,000. Is that the plan to do schematic design for DPW? It's, it's under Public Works Administration. Yes, I believe that's what that's for. Okay, so that's what that's where that that money that that money's put. And so I was just looking at that happens once, that's approved, yes. That's, that's, that's approved money, and that's once you have a place. So that's money that's on hold till you know where you're, go where you're moving, where fire's moving. So that's the placeholder money? I believe so. It's 4410, Sonia, 4410 Pub Public Works Administration. It's in the book, book it's page 70. And when I do the scroll online, it's 98. <laughs> you know, the nine. Yeah, I did, it was just a question because there's not a, a little oh, note see. on what the number is. And, and I assume that must, what must be, that you, under mm -hmm. personnel administration, you didn't suddenly have a giant capital expense. Yeah. No, but usually when we have capital expenses, they do eventually. I, I can't tie it back, like just going back and forth here, but it's all in the capital plan. It's whatever was approved in the JCPC process that's coming forward is is what's in those line items. So I can get that for you, but it's going to take me a few minutes. But It's not so much I need to know exactly. I just was trying to tr trace if I'm looking at something called pu public works administration, I see a giant jump. I was just assuming that's what it was. So that's right. just the question, because I knew it. I, I knew... It that that is the only. That's the only thing we requested that, that went was approved. That actually covers the whole department. Yes, was the DPW building. Yeah. Can I? That's um in the budget book. That's all supplemental information. So especially capital is going to jump up and down from year to year depending on what's put through the JCPC process. So that's not unusual to see it jump like that or go way down from the previous year. And I just wanted to point that out for a future. Yeah, let's maybe go back to um, my service, my days in which I was on the prior finance committee. But I think that what we did at the time was is that there was a feeling that um, people wanted to see what the total cost was related to various departments. And since employee benefits was actually under general government and um, capital was under a different section of the budget, throwing supplemental information in there was to try and give a place where you could um, see that, but it doesn't make it a part of that section of the budget. And I think that was the intent back then, if I recall. Um, but that was back. Yes. Um, so I, fo I found the place that Kathy's referring to, and I'm trying to figure out, are you saying that the going from 40000 to 270000 that that money is being spent or that money is being held as reserves? I'm not sure which it is. That money is being proposed in the current budget to be used for the next phase of the DPW project. That's planning, you mean? It's planning. Okay. If you, if once you approve the budget, then it will be. It goes into what is uh, no, uh, development of, of schematic plan. Is that the term that 
turning to Lynn and asking this. Uh, schematic design. Schematic design. It goes into schematic design, which is the point at which you have to have a location for the building to, in order to do that. So that's why we're sort of, but if you don't have the money sort of set aside, you can't do it. You can't do it. Um, yes, Shelby. Question about um, sidewalks and cr um, crosswalks. Um, is there attention, special attention given to people with disabilities? You know, like I, I get cons emails from people about concerns about downtown and how slow it is to fix and stuff, especially keeping in mind people with disabilities. So, <laughs> one of the biggest costs now for actually doing road repairs, once we touch a sidewalk or once we touch a road and an intersection, we have to bring it up to ADA standards. So we actually, every time we do a project, we have to bring it up. So yes, there's some people who walk a certain section of road or a certain section of sidewalk, and it hasn't gone into a big project yet, and it's slower to get fixed because we don't have a bigger project and we're spending all our money to make those improvements on the other projects. Does that make? Yeah. That's. But this would be just maintenance though not like taking on a new project like adding a new crosswalk or something but just the maintenance of the pavement so people in wheelchair and so forth can so if you if we go we're main, we're doing maintenance work on main street and we're working on the sidewalks so we have to change every handicap ramp to meet ada compliance when, while we're doing the project so that's why a lot of that money gets used up is making those ADA compliance changes while we're doing maintenance on a bigger road project. And one additional question I had going back to buildings gets us back to the, uh, something you worked with us in very closely on in Lynn and Paul, the zero energy building thing. I couldn't help but notice when uh, I was looking on page uh, 70, the amount of electricity utilities expense that was built into the administrative budget, and then um, seeing the amount of electricity going into the um, water facilities and wastewater treatment facility, and couldn't help but wonder if we were looking at best way to expend available dollars to save to to solarize and ultimately save money whether we're going and making the right choices by tying it solely to new buildings as opposed to buildings that where it could be most effectively capitalized uh, it's a, it's a good question uh, but you also have to realize if you look at the public works admin their electrical number is it's actually pretty small compared to water and wastewater so water and wastewater is process energy. It's not building maintenance or building it, building energy. Um, in the DPW building on South Pleasant Street, it's really just lighting. It's running the heating system. It's running the computers. Um, it's running a few electric gar uh, garage door openers. It's, it's, that's what the electricity is there. It's not a lot of process. Mm -hmm. When you get to the wastewater side, electricity is pumping water, wastewater. It's pushing wastewater. It's spinning and aerating wastewater, and then it's doing a lot of other things over there. It's dewatering wastewater so we can take the sludge and dispose of it. So the there is, if you could put solar at the wastewater facility and the water facilities, you would need a large amount of solar to manage those, where the DPW building, the solar would be much smaller, because that number is much, if you look at it, it is much smaller than those other two. But... Uh, yeah, it's just... No, thank you. Um, turning back then, uh, we were talking about highways and snow and ice, uh, which we always, uh, it is what it is. Depends upon what's, what we get for the year, I don't know. If yes, this year we went deficit. We're at, we went deficit this year by uh, about $130,000, dollars And it's, uh, Yes, there was no big snowstorms. People always ask, well, we didn't have big snowstorms. Uh, the big snowstorms, we love big snowstorms because those are the least expensive to take care of. It doesn't take a lot of money to go do a big snowstorm. You go out, you treat it, you plow it, you treat it when you're done, you're done. 
what, what's killing us now, in, in a sense, it's, you can call it type of global, the global weather pattern shifting is these smaller storms, you gotta go out and you gotta treat them, you gotta go out and treat them again, you gotta go out and treat them again, there's no big bang for your buck. You're just constantly treating these little storms and trying to keep things the way people expect them to be. So with actually the smaller storms are more draining on the budget than the big storm. And I assume that uh, everybody realizes we never want to have snowstorms on weekends, but we always seem to get them. We always get them on weekends and holidays. <clears throat> when we have to pay overtime. Um, anything else that people want to ask and then we'll move into, um, open it up also to street and traffic lights. Uh, Oops, get rid of that. Um. Nope, I'm fine. Um, I'm gonna put that in silence right now, but um, going on uh, also on the equipment maintenance and tree and ground uh, maintenance. Uh, see if there are any questions in there. Curious about the cemetery pieces. I saw that uh, we really are we required to provide cemetery space, or if we said there's no more plots available and look elsewhere, is that an option for the town? What's that page you on? Um, I'm on page 79 under long range objectives. Uh, yes, if we decide we don't want to be in the cemetery business or the new cemetery business, the town can decide that. Um, but we will always be in maintaining the existing cemeteries. Our three, we can't just, I don't think anybody would want to buy our three cemeteries. So our, our three cemeteries will be maintaining those in per perpetuity, just like the landfill. So, uh, but when we run out of space, we run out of space. So if we don't get new land somewhere, we would be out of the cemetery business. Out of the new cemetery business. Could I ask where the new where, where the cemeteries are? We have one in South Amherst. We have one behind the toy box, which is West Cemetery and North Cemetery up in the top. It's off of East Pleasant Street. There's four in town. Wildwood's the fourth one, and that's privately owned. So I just leave it at that, but draw it to, back to our attention that at some point. Um, Council may want to have a economic analysis of whether it's worth staying in the cemetery business if we reach that point, but uh, I don't think we need to discuss that today. Um, anything else? Um, tree and ground maintenance. And do, do, do we pass street and traffic lights already? Yes, but go back. Yeah, can we just go back? Yes. I just had a quick question on them. Um, and it related to the crosswalk question, uh, sort of either installing a new traffic light, installing a blinking light, um, those kinds of decisions, uh, painting a crosswalk line. Do you have a way of, um, I, I know the answer is yes, so I'll ask it. <laughs> when you're setting priorities on which things to do, um, the more heavily trafficked crosswalks with blinking lights. I think the one on Pine Street works quite well, for example, you know, just to let people know there is a crosswalk and then you, in the dark, you actually see people going across the street. So on North Pleasant, where there are the crossings and where we had someone hit who either was or wasn't immediately in a crosswalk, how, the, how expensive it is to do that. And can any kind of lights be more passive solar. Like I have some grat in my lawn where they come on every night and they're powered by the sun and they get the sun the next day. You know, they're never using electricity. Um, so there is, uh, so there yeah, is it's a, a mixed question. Yeah, it's it's a good. question of how can we do it less expensively if we need more of them. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm not sure less expensive is ever possible in this world anymore. <laughs> You can do uh, solar powered lights, since sort of like what you're talking about, the ones you have in your yard. Uh, they're bigger, they're industrial. 
um, the battery that's in your solar power light's just a little AAA, a double A battery. You'd have a battery on the light that's an industrial size battery. So it's a, it's a big box, not a very big box. But you can have a solar panel charge the battery in that box and then that light light from the battery all night long so that the light's not connected to the system. Um, you can do that. UMass had some of those over by the Mullen Center before they put the big solar can't carports in. They actually had street lights in the parking lot that were lit by a solar battery and a solar panel. If you, go, if you drive through New Jersey, uh, every street light in New Jersey has a big solar panel on it, a little battery. Some have batteries, some don't, but they do the same thing. Um, that was Con Ed, New Jersey's way of doing solar. <laughs> little, little things everywhere. Uh, as far as where we put traffic, or where we put crosswalks, and where we put um, the RRFBs or any type of enhancements. If someone requests a crosswalk, it goes through a process which is examined to see if we really want to put a crosswalk in. Um, we don't just put a crosswalk in anywhere. We have to make it ADA compliant, so it costs a little more money than you would think. Um, if we have a crosswalk and we want to upgrade it, that's easier. Um, the RRFBs are around $12,000 a pair, I think is what they are. Um, that's pre, pre this round of tariffs, I think. Um, I don't know what the new price is. We've been warned all our prices are going up. Um, so they're about $12,000 a piece. And they all run on, they're all solar powered. So when you see one of those RRFBs, there's no power from the grid going to it. It's all a little box, a little battery, and a solar panel charging it. I should mention, uh, just for uh, my colleagues, that Pine Street was a complex project that had, um, where we were dealing with um, water, sewer, and street all together, and the building of the sidewalk and the installation of the crosswalks which were required because of the multiple crossings in the design. It was kind of like this big, huge web that was all interrelated and uh, Guilford spent many hours trying to uh, get the select board together on a uh, plan for that. I used to have dark hair before that project. Uh, so, um, I want to keep this moving along, and um, so have we. Are there other questions that come under the general DPW budget before we turn to the enterprise funds? I had a crosswalk question that brings us to the enterprise funds. It's when you asked at the beginning when you saw the amount paid back to the general fund from the enterprise funds, where did it go in general? When you do the accounting um, for, like I saw a draw that said paying back for town council for water or whatever it was, do you do, a, how is that actually accounted for? You say, you know, X hours of certain people were used. Oh, do how do you come up with those numbers? Yes, yeah, you know, how do you, you know, I said, oh, this is interesting why do we work drinking a lot. You know, I don't remember which one I saw, but it, it was a very laid out and it came up with a number. And yes. since the total seemed to be in the half million dollar range, this, these were, we edited it all up. So it was, yeah. So I'll start and then they can finish. So uh, we, we basically, it's, it's been this way since I've been here and most people who have utility or enterprise systems do it basically the same way. You kind of just pick a point and you start going back in time and you figure out what you used that year or you pick a year and you make that your base year, and um, you come up with what, you know, if the town manager spent maybe 10% of his time doing, dealing with water and sewer issues, that's kind of how you based out these things. And what we do, and what it, most people do, is you have your baseline where you come up with that just examining one year, and then every so many years you look at it and adjust it. And we do that in Amherst. Every, every couple of years we look and see, well, are we using this much of this service, or are we using this much of that service? Um, because the other thing that happens is, is that if, if we need something done and we actually directly ask the administrative side to do it for us, um, that's figured up and that's added in. 
and then we have to go at a later time, or a couple years later, we check to make sure that that number we added in is still correct. So it's a basically an analysis of the cost or the time we think we're spending. We don't actually do timesheets, but we do a general accounting of our time, and we break it down, and then we just always keep validating it every few years and make sure we're right. And they're going to tell me I'm totally wrong now. Thank you. So, um, water fund, we'll start with, uh, just do them in the order. And uh, we've had some fairly good discussion of the water fund already, so it's just a question at this point as to whether there are others, other questions that come up. Um, We do have a very we do have a very good supply of water right now. Yes. Which, yes. Well planned. Good job. Uh, we were tired of it. <laughs> the uh, one question that I had is, and this touches back on something that I think it was Kathy who asked about. Um, if our rates, we, we had to do something with our rates, for example. Is there an alternative for the university or are, they, are we the sole provider that they can consider at this point? There's always alternatives. It's a matter of how much they want to pay for the alternative. The UMass could become their own water system if they want to, and then they can decide whether they wanted to have a, any type of supply on campus or off campus and pipe it to them. But they would have to become a water provider, and they would incur the same cost we would incur, we incur now. They do not incur that cost. They just pay for the service. They don't have to do the testing. They don't have to do the management. They don't have to have the licensed operators. They don't have to freak out when the well blows off in the middle of a hockey game and leave the hockey game and go take care of the well. They have other problems they freak out over, but that's not one they have. So yes, if they wanted to and spend that money, they would also have to disconnect themselves from our system. Our water system is pretty much entangled among the campus. It wasn't meant to be that way, but it's kind of how it developed. We have one main line that runs through the campus, and the campus feeds off that line, and they would have to segregate those lines off our main and put them on their main. Um, they would have to also segregate all their other buildings off, and they could not totally disconnect from the system. They would always be some of their buildings because of where they're situated, and it's easier and cheaper to be on our system. It's actually overall easier and cheaper to be on the town system anyhow. Could they go to Hadley and ask Hadley to provide water? They could, but then they would have to be a disconnect from the town system as well. You can't have the two systems together. The systems, the way they were regulated is, is each system is self-contained and is regulated separately. And if you have a connection between the two, two systems, they have to be protected, and you have to monitor them, and you have to make sure there's no contamination between the two systems. Um, Hadley doesn't do fluoride. We do fluoride. Um, not, to, not to start that discussion, but, <laughs> um, but we do connect with them every once in a while to give them water for something they're doing, and they have to warn their customers and say that's what's going on. But then we have to watch and make sure that we're, if there's a contamination issue in Hadley, it, makes a contamination issue for us. Um, so we're very careful, and, and the way the water systems are managed, it's meant to be careful and it's meant to be segregated so that you can, if you have a problem, you can research the problem and solve the problem quickly. So yes, they could, but it's a cost and it's an expense they would have to bear. I, I guess it, this really does go back to those challenges you presented in the very beginning, uh, particularly the ones around water management and the potential of very serious um, new goals that could, not just goals, but targets that you could come forward in the next permit. And um, so you've got part of our town that nine months a year has heavy, heavy usage. And yet for three months a year, they don't. We'd look at it on the average, obviously. But if they're more, if they're having more difficulty exceeding or meeting 
those new standards. Should we consider a change in their rate? Um, I'm not sure I'd consider the change in their rate. Um, they're, they're, well, I think what we're going to find is that DEP is going to want us to have some type of penalty mechanism in place uh -huh. for people who cannot meet the standards. And you can call that an, a higher rate, a penalty rate, mm -hmm. or you can just call it a penalty on top of the rate they're paying for the water. Um, it's uh, something that's still being discussed among the water people and among the EP, but you can do either one. But yes, there would be something that would be mandatorily required. So we could have a tiered water rate system, and then on top of that, there would be like a penalty for you just not making an additional penalty. Mm -hmm. So as we come back to that whole challenge and we think of the new committee that we've created, Energy and, um, I'll come up with its name, ECAC, um, it's, it seems to me that it's going to be very important that the water and sewer people are connected into that committee as they look at goals and to make sure that our systems not just meet the DEP standards, but also any other standards that they would like to see the town is in general meet. Yeah, and that would make sense. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason I had actually thought to ask the question was on page 130, where you're yep. talking about the debt service you mentioned um, is one of the long range projects, uh, North Pleasant Street water line replacement project from Massachusetts Avenue to Eastman Lane. And I couldn't help but wonder how much of that has to do with getting water from one end to the other but to serve residences and businesses and how much of it was to serve UMass as an institution. Um, yeah. To yeah. Tell, tell the truth, it's probably, it's, it's meant to just improve the overall water system. Um, during times when we have lots of water in the reservoir, uh, UMass and that side of town is served by Atkins Reservoirs. Uh, when the, we cut back on the reservoirs and don't take as much water from the reservoirs, we actually flow water from the south in the town up through. So um, it's hard to say. It would be hard to say who gets the most benefit out of it. As a system-wide, it is the big, one of the biggest system improvements we want to make is just to get rid of the two smaller pipes and put a larger pipe in there, just one pipe larger, and be able to connect it better. Um, so it's an overall system improvement. It's not being driven by UMass or a need to serve UMass. Mm. Yeah, Lynn? Actually, Dorothy. Dorothy. Um, I, I may be missing the point here. Um, when it comes to the lower uh, individual consumption rates, and that would include UMass students, um, does that mean talking with the university and having them um, post uh, water limits or shower time limits? Um, because isn't that where a lot of the water goes? That, that is something that has to be decided, is how do, if we start identifying places that are actually exceeding the, the state goal, it's a goal, they have people who are exceeding that goal, how do we handle it? Do we look, go to the customer, and if it's a large apartment complex as well as UMass, do we have the apartment complex send notices out to their, their tenants saying, hey, uh, we're using a lot of water, we're exceeding the goals of the state, we need to cut back on water. The state, UMass would be, have to do the same thing uh, if it's an issue in Amherst College. Um, it might drive, um, Amherst College is moving, to, or I mean, uh, UMass is moving towards metering all their buildings. Um, Amherst College hasn't metered their buildings, but it might drive some of the larger people to meter their individual buildings so they can uh, you know, pinpoint who is the big user in the problem. So there's a lot of things that could happen. There's a lot of things that have to be worked out and thought about how, how we would implement all these things. And it's a lot moving forward. And, and when, when we do something like Northampton Road, which is a state highway, and we're going to be tearing it up for sewer replacement. Water line. Water line, thank you. Um, how does that work in terms of the actual reconditioning then of the road? Who pays for that? So we actually got lucky. <laughs> uh, the Northampton Road project by the state was proposed, and we had been looking at replacing the water line at the same time yeah. or earlier. 
Um, we've actually delayed the water line because we want the state to do it at the same time. That actually saves money for us because we're only paying for the water line and the water trench. We don't have to pay for the paving and the final pavement. That's all gonna be paid for by the highway project. So a project that we thought was gonna be $2 million when we first started and maybe a little more now because we've moved out in time um, is going to be still very economical. It would have probably been three or $4 million if we actually had to repair the road to state standards and the state wasn't doing their part, doing the road at the same time. It's, it's distinguished from what happened on Pine Street. Yes, it's based, yes, if you, right. we spent $4 million on Pine Street and all that was water and sewer and yeah. Paved. And then you did those fancy stickers on people's cars, I survived Pine Street. Uh, we didn't do that. Some yeah. enterprising young person at the Cushman store, I believe, was selling those. <laughs> Um, so other questions? Uh, yeah, I had, um, you have a, and I'm, I'm jumping around so I won't find the exact one, but you'll know it. We have a payment to, for watersheds to other towns. Is that land we purchased and we're repaying them in lieu of taxes on, on that land? Uh, it's not in lieu of taxes. We own land in Pelham, we own land in Shutesbury, and we own land in Belchertown and Hadley. Um, is that right? Is that all of them? Leverett. Leverett, Shutesbury, Pelham, Belchertown, and Hadley. We pay property tax at the, at the proper rate for the land to those towns. We pay payment in lieu of taxes to the town of Amherst for watershed land in the town of Amherst. Okay. Anything else on the water fund, or should we turn to the sewer fund? No, I think that's fine. It's just when, we, when we're when we considering buying watershed land then, since we have, that's in another, that's on the 23rd when we see that, um, is the cost of that purchase, are we also putting in the cost of the taxes we're going to have to be paying here, doing some sort of, this will incur this much taxes each of the following years? Do we do that computation? We wait until we actually finish it, and the next year we'll put it in the budget, yes. But can I ask that question of what it would likely be when I'm looking at that uh, as a purchase? Yep. We can figure that, we can have that for okay. you. Yeah, I mean, of course the other side of the coin is what is the consequence for our water system of not doing no, it? No, I understand yeah. and it's, you know, since sometimes we're sharing it in regional water supply too, it's a consequence for everyone. I, I do understand, I just recognize that. Well, it's not regional in the, it's they, our water, we may be selling just, it. To, we may be us. selling it back, right. <laughs> but it's still our water system. Dorothy. Um, so right now we're having a lot of water and we're having the wettest year. I guess since they took records. But um, let's just say in 10 years, we have a real drought that goes on. Is there, how can we prepare? Can you, you can't save water. Um, or is there some way that you can actually increase the, the supply and see credit and keep it safe? Well, there, there's different things we do to try to keep our system resilient. Um, we actually have a lot of supply, different supplies. We, we have more, we, we were talking earlier that the water, the sources are rated, but then what we're allowed to withdraw is rated. We actually probably have one and a half times our rating right now. So of all our supplies, if we were rated to take out 5 million gallons a day, we actually probably have about, you know, seven and a half million gallons of rating. That's just a number, I just made it up. <laughs> I can never keep it straight. Um, so we, ha we have a lot of water sources and we have a lot of supply out there. Um, we did do a study with Tata and Howard and they came up with the, t the five things we should be doing for our major capital plan for the water, water department. Um, the first one is to um, do some automation at baby carriage. Baby carriage is an older plant but it um, was built as a manually operated plant. Um, that's out in the south end of town. It treats for iron and manganese. So we've been automating that plant. We've been installing backup generators so it can run automatically. We've been working on all this. The next thing they talked about doing was uh, re rehabbing the Centennial Water Treatment Plant. 
So we, can, we need to rehab that plant. Uh, we've actually kind of taken that plant offline. We've had some lightning strike kind of did that plant in, uh, but we need to rehab that plant. They talk about buying a water source or wa possible water source in the north end of town, another wa water source in that end of town to build our resilience and make sure we're good. So um, we have that plan and we're working towards it and probably we should be in, as far as what we have, we should be in good shape going for at least 10, 20 years out right now. And that's what we, that's how we are looking at it. Okay. Other questions? Those are sort of turn solid, make sure we get the solid waste. Hey. Shelly? Can you explain why we're making this for interest and delayed payments to be hundred like hundred percent more this time. It's like double of last year. It's for till wait one second. Why did we budget more this year? Why are we yeah, for water and for sewage as well. It seems it's like we're expecting We actually had more last year than we okay. budgeted, so we adjusted this Adjust. year's budget to reflect last year's we got we got more. We're still on, um, I think what we're, we're just finishing up wastewater. with wastewater. And I think that I, the last point that I'll make to this committee and then I want to go, as we go on to solid waste is that um, very soon, coming back to the council, um, will be the water and sewer rate request. And the reasons for rate tie back into the budget that we just looked at, these two budgets. So to the extent that we're gonna come back um, or ask to come back and offer comments on the water rate increase to recognize that what we've just looked at is the material that is really the backup for that question to some extent. There will be additional information provided but not to lose sight of the connection between the two. Um, so if there's nothing else, we should go on to solid waste and see if there are questions there and, or just overall comments. You made a few already. It is our- Solid waste is not our stellar performer of enterprise systems. Um, we don't make a lot of payments to the town for our, their support, and we don't, uh, it, it's, not, it's not run as like you would, like we talked about how an enterprise system should run. It's kind of struggling right now. Um, we are looking at possibly raising the rates because we know we're getting some rate increases for disposal cost, um, but it's, uh, it's a struggling enterprise system. The one question that I had from that fund and is uh, there's nothing in there for capital expenditures projected for equipment. And uh, it seems, I mean, at some point we do have to, there is equipment there. We've, uh, we mostly, what we do is any, when we replace a piece of equipment in the public works department and we're, it's still in a usable condition, it gets passed down to be recycled at the recycling facility. Um, they have an older pickup truck. They have an older backhoe they're using. Um, there is one piece of equipment that is going to have to, and we're actually trying to get a grant to help pay for it. That's the, the roll-off truck. Um, when it actually gets to some point, we may have to make a decision on whether we keep providing the services we provide. Um, or will we change a little bit? Um, we've never wanted to do trash collection in this town. The, when I got here, I was told we never want to do this. We don't want to do it. It's still the, it's been the position up until uh, now. Um, the world of trash collection around the town has changed. There's only one local, truly local trash hauler in town now. Um, as you look at the solid waste, or sorry, the refuse recycling management committee's report that they did, their final report, they had some recommendations. 
uh, time might be right to pursue some of those recommendations and uh, maybe change a little bit. And that might change how we run the transfer station. You're always gonna have an expense at the landfill. Our monitoring will be required and probably indefinitely. Uh, I don't think DEP will ever say we can stop monitoring the landfill. We'll probably have to keep monitoring both landfills well for probably another 20 or 30 years. Um, usually it's only a 20 year period where you monitor a landfill, but we never really uh, closed out the old, the old landfill, which is across the street. That was never really closed out until 2004 or five. The paperwork wasn't finished, although it was capped in the 80s. Uh, the new landfill was capped in 2002. Um, we're coming up on 20 years and most landfills are, will stop monitoring, but in the, the world we live in now, I don't think DEP is going to not let you stop monitoring a landfill until, you, until something happens and the landfill vanishes, but I don't think that's going to happen either. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we're always going to have an expense for landfill, whether we're doing transfer or waste services or whether we're just monitoring the system and running the flares. We're always going to have an expense out there. So the question is, where do you want to put that expense? Do you want to keep it in a struggling enterprise system that mostly makes it, or do you want to move it totally to the general fund or do something else with it? Yes. Um, if you, you, you started with your remarks on the struggling side, that we have a recommendation, there was a report with some recommendations, and would we ever revisit, does Amherst want to do trash pickup or try, you know, consolidate it? Could you have an enterprise fund that was the trash collection and use a private contractor to be picking up the trash? And I'm partly asking this because when it was presented to us, and then I've also been hearing from residents, having more than one contractor for one small street is trucks going by during the day. Um, and you could, if you still wanted to have some competition in the system, say you get a quarter of the town or you get a fifth of the town and you can, your service will determine whether we're renewing your, or half the town, you know, something that is continuing to say that we're not going to sole source. So it's a, would that help a fund like this? Could we combine that with solid waste? I don't know if that would help the fund, um, but other communities do do it. <coughs> where, they, where it's a town-based system, but they use private contractors for the service? Yes, other towns do do that. And if, if we wanted to even think about whether that was a good idea, where would uh, an initial proposal with, you could do it this way or that way, where would that originate? With, with you or with? I think as the town manager. With the town manager, okay. <clears throat> okay, anything else on solid waste fund? No. Because otherwise uh, then we should go into transportation and I don't know if you're the prime presenter or are you gonna hand that back to the other guy? Um, no, I'm fine. Okay. We'll work it, we'll, we'll tag team it. The tag team. So, um, this is our first question for Sonia is, uh, what is our, uh, the remaining surplus in the fund? Is it 53,000 now, after the amount that was spent by town meeting last year, do you know? The, the um, cash balance and all of these enterprise funds are in the uh, revenue pages, the resources and the significant, uh, 169, if you look at the bottom, significant budget changes, you'll see what the balance was at the end of, the, of um, at the end, July 1, 2018. It was 133,246. And that was July 1, 2018, and then in 20, FY 2019, uh, which is the year we're in now. Mm -hmm. So we won't know that number. Yeah, we don't know the number, but we, but town meeting 
put 53,000 into, right? Uh, about half of it, if I recall correctly. So that number is going to be substantially decreased. And if um, bus service, which was what this was all about, um, to continue it, you know, this gets into very complex issues that we've talked about at the council level previously, but uh, sustaining a draw on the transportation fund to supplement what we were previously doing, I guess, is a financial question that we just need to be aware of as a group. Uh, so I just want to point out that this is at a certain point in time. If you were to take the vote from town meeting of 53000 and subtract it from there, you can do that. But by the time the next free cash comes along, whatever surplus or deficit was in the fund is going to be subtracted from there. So you, you really, it's, it's a big calculation that the state does, and it never works out like a checkbook. So. Right. <laughs> uh, that's why I say, in the end, I think the only thing I say is it likely would be reduced uh, as a result. Um, I want to just point out one other thing, but in, before doing that, see what other questions that we have, just as you've looked at this. I was just curious about the drop in the parking fees. Um, it seems to have gone down. I was just wondering if it's related to the increase in the parking um, f um, charges and if that's affecting people from coming downtown. Is there a particular line or just the overall number? It, there's a negative 7% right. in the transportation fund under the line called parking meter fees. 169 page. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be. There's a decrease in the budget. But if you look at the FY18 actuals, we don't have FY19 actuals yet. So you're looking at actuals versus budget of a different year, so. But in FY18, it's actually up from 17. I, I, I guess I would, I'm just building on that if it was up in 18, why did we budget for it being down in 19? And when will you know whether 19 looks more like 18? Well, the, the negative 7% you're seeing is taking the two budgets from fiscal year 19. We budgeted a higher amount than we did this year. We might not have needed as much revenue to balance out the budget this year. We have to balance out the budget. So it's, it's kind of like we had to reduce somewhere. If you look, 19 budget was 1.1 million. The 20 budget is 1 million. So it's less there. So the revenue, you have to make it balance. If, but if you're asking questions about whether people are, if we're having less use of the parking system, that's really what you're asking, right? Uh, anecdotally, we're having discussions about the fact that there are less people using it. Um, there's also more people using the apps. So like the parking fee fines are down because people are in their restaurant or wherever and they're just, putting more money because they can do it on the app, so there's less tickets being written because of that. Um, there is information, and we've been, we, it's <clears throat> going to be looked at a little more, but it hasn't really been flushed out as, you know, is, 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 are people parking less um, because the rates are higher? There, there's some anecdotal information, but there's no, we haven't really found anything concrete other than the fact that people do seem to find it easier, and they're on their phones to pay with a pay app instead of so they get less tickets. We know tickets are definitely down. So, so that would suggest that uh, if, in fact, people use the parking system correctly, don't go, overstay their time, um, don't get tickets, um, that you shouldn't reduce that as a source of revenue. Um, well, we would reduce it as a source of revenue from the projection, knowing that we're going to get less. That's why it would be, re yes. 
So then you, there are various places that that affects, but um, obviously parking violations is projected down, but um, meter fees were projected down too. That was, I think, what the question was. That was the question. We just that was we were looking at a very specific line, not at the total. I think yeah. the projection down on the parking meter fees is the fact that we don't have to project as much because our budget is less this year. Right. Exactly. So we didn't. The enterprise systems have to what you expend and what you take in as revenue have to balance. It has to be totally balanced. So if your revenue, if what you're spending is less. You can cut down your revenue to make a match. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's all that is in the budget this year, mostly when you look at revenue from the meters. We're just trying to make the two numbers balance, and we have a lower number to make balance. So, so basically, we back into the revenue number from based on the budgeted number. And if we have a lower budgeted number, which is what we do have, then we can project less money. We may bring in more, and that's okay because that'll wind up in the transportation funds free cash, but we have to come up with transportation or any kind of enterprise fund has to balance at zero. So it's, all, it's always more important to look at the actual. When you're right. trying to figure out how the system's performing, look at the actual numbers we took in the year before. Those actuals are better because, yes, we do, balance, we do fluctuate the projections to make that thing balance. Can I just say on this because I don't completely, I understand what you're saying, but I don't understand it conceptually on the other question um, where Andy started with how much is left in a free cash if we are in fact bringing in more revenue you know if the actual for 2019 then our free cash once we do the books is going to be higher because right we're pretty good on what our expenses are so that we potentially have money to do something with buses that we don't yet know about. So I'm just thinking that the, these three conversations are interactive because we've got one line lower than it might actually be that's a revenue source. Right. Welcome to municipal budgeting. Okay. There's, no, um, but I think that's budgetary. very interesting to know because, well, mm -hmm. at some point, we're almost at the end of FY19, we'll have a pretty good idea somewhere at the beginning of FY20 what 19 actually was, right? Mm -hmm. And then you'll get a more solid sense of the reserves, right? Correct. Right. Then we submit all the information to the DOR and they set the free cash figure. So I do want to change the subject a little bit, but still it's very much transportation just to call your attention to something and ask you to look at page 171 and then I'm going to tell you why I picked 171. Um, in April, Nelson Nygaard um, released their study on parking and um, it was a presentation that was made. And the, one of the things they talked about was what the expense would be to build a new parking facility. And um, what they said, and because we know that there are certain people we hear from in the business community who very much think that that's what we should do. And it's 40, what Nelson Nygaard was telling us is to assume that it would cost $40,000 a space to build the facility and that we would need $275 per month in revenue in order to um, pay for the cost of building those spaces with the financing that's required over time. And, um, so when you look at $275 per month and then you look at the annual average meter revenue per space that's at the bottom of the chart that's um, the, at the bottom of, that's page 171, um, you very quickly realize that revenues are not going to be at the level that would be required to actually pay for building a facility. And that's assuming, of course, that you build it out of the enterprise fund, that the enterprise fund is going to take care of itself, um, which then means that what is being suggested by people who argue that we should build a new garage is 
that we would actually have to pay for it out of other taxation revenue and it would compete with our other capital needs to build a new elementary school, to build a DPW facility, a fire station, uh, the library. So it's not a simple set of calculations. And um, as a finance committee, I think we need to be able to understand this point because I can see this issue coming back to us in future discussions at, at a council meeting. And um, we, at least as a finance committee, need to understand the complexity of this economic problem. I'm just trying to figure out, Andy, how you're coming up with the numbers to actually tell us this. It was in the Nelson Nygaard report. Okay, thank you. But it's, yeah. I can't come up with those numbers unless no, I know it's not, the it's number not of in spaces here. It's here. A okay. it's, I, I was melding two different documents. Okay. I took the April okay. Nelson Nygaard report, and it said $40,000 per space, $270 per month required revenue. And I compared the $275 per month required revenue against the annual revenue that is shown for each of these um, mm -hmm. facilities. And of course, you have annually you have to take it by 1 12th. Mm -hmm. um, that's where the dilemma is. And you'd have to take it by the number of spaces. Um, I was at that meeting, and I think I've, I've spoken about <clears throat> the second part of his report, which was that they had found that there was lots of little pockets of parking or possible parking in the town of Amherst. Uh, some of them were private lots with which one could make, the town could make arrangements. But that the other thing was, we mentioned the parking apps, was that the people are using, I, I of course don't know how to do it, but people are using these parking apps. And if the parking app language matches the language that the town names things, people will be able to find spots without us building a garage. He was pretty, pretty firm yeah. that no, the garage I, was not I, I, a I reasonable estimate. I realize that, and I was not trying to get us into a full-fledged parking discussion today. I was just trying to point out that if we hear from people who are saying, no, 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 that those avenues are not going to work or we're not even going to try and make them work, we just need to commit to building a new garage. That I think it's important that the finance committee begin to grapple with the, uh, what really is involved with building a new garage so that we can respond to those questions. And it was because we were going through the budget book and those numbers happened to be in the budget book that it was, it was just a good opportunity to make that point. That was all I was trying to do. I, I I just want to digress for just one more minute and ask a question that has been on my mind for a while. When Boltwood was built, it was there was a lot of controversy. It was supposed to be a four-story garage or something like that. And it was argued down to the two stories that it is. But supposedly the structure at that time was built so it could have been added on to. In today's requirements, for garage construction. Is that still true? Uh, yes, but we have other constraining factors now because of the way we've built adjacent buildings next to the garage. Um, there's setbacks that need to be, there's changes, there's been some changes in some of the setbacks, um, and some of the newer buildings, especially the ones on the North Pleasant side that have built back towards the garage, uh, have might impact how you would align that wall. So I don't think there's any other, none of the other sides is impacted, but the North Pleasant Street side may be impacted so that you couldn't build it the way it was designed at that time. And that's probably the only caveat I think there is right now. Thank you. Okay. So. I, I just, I would be curious to know whether people knew that when they were giving uh, permits for the buildings to go up? I mean, just did anyone report on, we will re be restricted later if we should ever want to add floors to the garage? 
I think it had more to do with the rules changing as we went along, so that the things were allowed to be built, and then the rules kind of changed a little bit, and that put us in this in the in the situation I think we're in. So it wasn't something you knew at the time you gave them permission to build the building. Okay. I'm afraid that may be a question that more appropriate to be asking people who are in the planning board sure, at the sure. time. Sure, sure. No, I, I, I can time. figure out where to ask it in other uh, places. Yeah. I'm just not sure that. Um, so is there any other questions about the transportation fund? The, the only question I have is, do you, are you DPW or is a town manager um, setting rates, uh, including rates for the parking garage and the reserved rates? So who, who makes those decisions? You mean in terms of parking fees and things like yeah. that? Parking fees for the meters, and then there are the 25 reserved place in the, the, the underground mm -hmm. that are $1,000 a year. Mm -hmm. There's so much for permit if you get us. I just don't know where the location of decision for what those rates are sits. Who? What entity? It's either the town council or the town manager or probably a combination of the two in the okay. sense that because it's in the public way, it's in a sense the town council, but in terms of management of town property, it could be the town manager. So it depends exactly what you're talking about, I guess, in terms of if you're talking about the garage versus being in the public way. So the last time we set rates, we did it much the way we do water and sewer rates. We, the people who manage the fund, look at things we have to do. So the transportation fund has uh, input from the public works department, input, input from the police who do enforcement, and input from the collector's office. So normally we would sit down and talk about the things that are upcoming expenses are coming or where we wanted to be, and then we would say we need to look at making a, a rate adjustment, and then it goes to the town manager, and the town manager usually flushes us out and makes sure we're, we know what we're talking about and we come to a good decision, and then the last time we set rates, they were recommended to the, count, the select board, and the select board approved them, but they went through another, um, we had an advisory committee, a parking advisory committee that also looked at them as well. The downtown Parking Working Group. Yes. Okay, that answers it, you know, in terms of we could think of what we might need if we want to think about this. So I think a lot of these issues are going to be addressed by the parking study that Nelson Nygaard is working on right now and that we expect to get this summer. And I think that, that once we get that and are able to digest that, I would assume that this in the fall is when the council will be grappling with parking issues across the board as a comprehensive system. And it is, and it's going to be a complex web because it deals with issues of parking and make in parking availability and it is a revenue question for this enterprise fund so it really kind of touches both places I totally agree and you know I was at early presentation not the formal one but I went to the committee and it's just several people have noted if you go downstairs in the garage not that people love to hang out in the sec the underground those reserve spaces are often empty at night when people are searching for a place to park. So it's just, it's part of the overall picture of what do we have downtown and are we using it in the way that works the best for people who live here. Yeah. So I think the reason they set that rate at $1,000 a year is that if you look at what the revenue comes in from a regular parking, it's, it's at the high end of what a normal, par uh, normal parking space would bring in. So um, the logic that at the time that they set those rates was that it was it produced more revenue than if it was open market. Sure, you know, I could, I could see that, and I could see that you've got your reserve space till 5.30 at night, or, you know, you get it during the day when you really need it, and then if you want to park that night, it's free for anybody. You know, so I just think it's, it's a revisiting these things yeah. rather than was it the right or wrong decision? Yeah. It's a complex question because yeah. the um, residents of buildings who live in the, who are in the area use those spaces too, and so the park the cars that are parked down there are in that classification. So, but we're not going to get and solve that today. Just just a little caveat to think about when you do this. There's one thing that's changed since the last time we had a real discussion about parking rates in town, and that change is the fact that we now allow parking overnight in the winter. It used to be you had to find a place to park off street during the winter. 
So almost all UMass students and all Amherst College students that came to town, they went and found a place to park off street the whole winter because they knew they needed it. Now you only need it for like six or seven times a, a year, a season. So that changes the dynamic a little as well, is that we've now given free Good hunting point. permits, which we never had before. So it, it'll make your discussion really interesting to see, because that's going to be something that plays into it. <laughs> I, and I have one question more. Yeah. Um, when people talk about parking and possible garages, um, sometimes they mention the CVS lot. And the question is, well, Northampton has this big garage, and it's free for the first hour. And why can't we do it? And I have no idea what funding sources were used or how Northampton built that garage. Um, it would be interesting to know some of that because just to counter the arguments that people might make. Northampton built their garage the same way we're we would propose to build a garage. They had an enterprise system that was a transportation enterprise system. They bonded for it and they built the garage. They set the rates based on offering people the first hour free and they set the whole thing up. It's gone through three changes in how they collect revenue in the garage from when it started. Originally, it started with a person in the booth, and then it went to a pay at the gate, and then it went to a pay and a kiosk type system. So it's been through multiple changes, but they were an enterprise system. Um, that's how they got the funds to do it, and they bonded for it, and they, um, they should actually it should be done paying it off because when I was working there, that was a 2000s, that was early 2000s. So they should be close to paying it all off by now. And, but you can ask them, the, the people, some of the people who were involved, are, well, there's a small number that are still there, but there's a few people that were still involved when they did it, still there. Okay. Anything else um, on the, because otherwise, so thank you. Thank you very much, Guilford. You've been you. great. It's appreciated, and I appreciate the way you started us off with um, keying us towards the challenges that uh, we need to be aware of. So thank you. I, I thank also you. just want to make an observation for the town manager, Guilford, and others, and that is if we had not had the overviews we had early in our tenure on the council, we'd be sitting here with a whole lot more questions. But that really helped us have a grounding on who you are, who's DEP, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you very much for those. Yep. You're most welcome. I want to say I appreciate your incredible institutional memory. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wish I didn't have that sometimes, but <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. So um, as far as other business is concerned, we'll yeah. Um, one thing I have, and I assume that, Paula, you've seen it too, is the draft report that I sent out earlier. Um, and so it's just a question of whether there are any other com any comments on it or whether um, it's good to go. Uh, I move that we, I, I move that we accept it. Um, it's just a matter of, as uh, uh, I tried to summarize it and uh, make it easy for the council. No, I, was, I, was just I think you did a very good job. I thought you did too. And as I told him when I first saw it, the only thing I found was one date was wrong. And, and he's, already, he's already fixed it. <laughs> so, so, so Lynn, is the same report coming up from CRC? Uh, I have to. I mean, I don't mean this uh, literally. The this same thing. vote is coming up yep. from CRC. What I don't know is whether they're going to actually have it in a report form. I don't know. Otherwise, um, I'm just going to take draft off of it and send it to Margaret. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that'd be great. No, I'm just thinking that the I draft have Andy's be. and a copy of this. I will send it to Steve and Dorothy and just say, will we have a similar report? The only reason I asked Lynn is it's probably helpful that they're at least similar enough so that when we look at it as a council, they're simple. <laughs> this, yeah, yeah I, I don't even know that CRC needs to repeat what I wrote. Being a member of both committees, I didn't right. feel... Yeah, I, exactly. Yeah, no, that's what I, 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 the, the wording was... Ditto, you know. Andy, the wording was the same, um, that the, um, the there had been a question on the item number three, the 35%. 
and you had responded with the, the wording as written and that the need for flexibility. Um, so that was the only, there had been that little additional discussion. Um, I think that Pat had said, let's make it more than 35%, and you responded that we could do that at any time, but that we would just go with the wording as it's in the motion so that we would have the flexibility to do what is needed at the time. Yes, that was part of the discussion. Yes. Would it be helpful to the town council to get the pros and cons or anything of how we came to this decision to include that in the report? Uh, what I will do is ask each of the committees to uh, briefly make a statement about their committee uh, discussion. We didn't really have a long discussion about it. I think that it just seemed like the appropriate thing to do that we recognized. Uh, we that. didn't, but I did think that the link, and then I read the report that Shalini referred to, so when we report out our minutes to the study that argued that a community impact fee made sense, might be worth at least making part of the record. You know, whether we, I don't think we need to write it into the report, but it was a useful report on saying why you, why this made sense? Yeah. Uh, we don't have to write anything. <laughs> yeah. We don't have, uh, since we hadn't read it at the time that we took our vote, I didn't feel like I could make it a part of the report. But, but you have a very nice paragraph here that, in fact, makes the arguments that were in that report. So the. They use yeah. town services, they benefit from our infrastructure, may have impact, you know, so that is exactly where that report goes with yeah. its thinking. Um, okay, so I think that the other thing is now... Uh, Andy, did you want to vote on that? Oh, um, well, we can take it as We don't have to actually don't vote have, on a report. We don't have to vote on a report, actually. The, Lynn did make it as a motion, so if there's a second, we should vote on it. I'll second it. Okay, so the motion is to approve this, uh, the report as written. Um, I, yes. All in favor indicate. So we'll make it unanimous, 5-0 uh, for the uh, purpose of minutes. I just want to go, and I don't know if uh, either Sonia or Paul have anything they want to add. Um, our next um, thing to, that we have to pay attention to, of course, is next week, um, the uh, budget hearing yeah. is coming up, and um, that is our hearing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, it's been posted as a, uh, for the council as a whole also if I recall, um, and, uh, but um, do we want to make any uh, presentation or have um, town manager make any presentation at the beginning or are we just opening it up for Paul? So I would be prepared to make a presentation uh, to the finance committee and to the full council and it would be sort of what I presented uh, but enhanced. So it'll be a more robust presentation with more numbers in it than the quick presentation on, during the, on May 6th when we handed off the report to the council. And I think that that would sort of lay the framework for what you have under your consideration. Um, could I suggest that you have some, some handouts of some sort? I, at this point, I'm not expecting many people, but those who come would be very happy to have a handout of some sort. Um, so you'll do, I'm sorry, you'll do the presentation similar to what you did to the council back on the 6th? But, but with more detail. Okay. We'll go through it uh, section by section of the budget report. So someone who's fresh to it and wants to see what's in the budget, they will be able to see it based on the presentation. And will you deal with the um, other funds that are discussed are presented with the budget page but not discussed at this time? particularly the CPAC? No, this, is ju this will just be the, the budget book. The, bu the budget book, basically, yeah. I think that there will be um, substantial questions, and I, I just see other hands, so I'm not, uh, uh, but there will be substantial questions about the capital plan, potentially, um, and uh, 
you know, I think that it will boil down to the major projects and roads and sidewalks probably. Um, and because I think we've been aware from the amount of constituent contact that there could be uh, questions and we've sort of been inviting it in a way um, about the CPAC report, which was um, and recognized that uh, it's not strictly a part of the budget, um, but people are going to feel uh, appropriate to raise those questions, and we have to be prepared for it. I thought that the Capitol was more the April, I mean, the June 10th meeting, which is a forum. It will be, but I'm not sure that you, we can ex assume okay. that okay. people won't. Yeah, I think, so I think you're not going to even see the Capitol proposals until the 23rd right. and the CPAC proposal. So, I think you're right. I think people are going to bring up those issues, and I think you can listen to them and take them into consideration because it is anytime anybody wants to come and talk to you, I think you should be able to listen, even if it's not tr perfectly on topic. Um, but it is really the presentation will be focused on the operating budgets, not on JCPC or the CPAC, because you're not even you're getting that presentation on May 23rd, I think. Um, That's right. And then you have the public here, the public forum on the capital budget on June 10th which is another opportunity for people to weigh in on, on anything capital. I need a refresher. This is a hearing, no. Yes. It says yeah. budget discussion, May, this is May 23rd. It's called a budget discussion, so it doesn't say it's a hearing or a forum. May no. 21st, Tuesday, is the public hearing on the operating hearing. budget. Okay. May 23rd is the a normal finance committee meeting in which you talk about capital plans. Okay. So and then June 10th is a public forum. Uh, where I always get, because I really have trouble with the language here. The hearing, you're going to talk, but then we're not going to talk because the audience talks. Okay. No. It, the, it, we do have the chance to respond, and in the budget hearing, we are not um, bound to the rule that applies to forum that 50% of the time is to engage the public. So it's the forum when we don't talk? It's the forum okay. where, well, it's a forum we can, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that before we get to the next forum, I think, and we'll get guidance on that. Um, but I, what I was, the other thing I was going to say is, is that on the 23rd, and then I can come back, uh, um, on 23rd, I'd like to at least have a little bit of time on our agenda, and maybe we need to amend our agenda to talk about what it is that we want is the content of our report that we're writing for the council um, to summarize all of our activity and work, um, because it's a We also subject. have to make a presentation, and we have to make a recommendation. Yes, and um, I think we start needing to think about the content um, because um, the former finance committee, as it was structured, had a type of report that doesn't make sense in our new form of government. And um, so what it is that the report looks like um, needs to capture what's important for the council, and um, we shouldn't be looking at town meeting as the guiding, the guidepost to that. Um, Shalini, do you had, uh, Kathy? Um, going back to Paul's presentation, um, the one, a couple places, I, you probably have already identified them, but the very last page didn't have June 10th on it, to put it back on. And I, I thought, because I, I had to do a short presentation of this for the district when I got to the capital piece. The charts you had on capital were great, but they didn't, uh, what they didn't show was sort of the, um, I had to talk about the total amount of money available and then the big decisions that were made. So just even if you do it verbally, people found that really interesting that we went up went back up to a million, we went up to 200,000 for sidewalks, and that that was in an out year plan, and that would be a way then of saying, stay tuned for June 10th, when we're gonna be, you know, so it's not a full discussion now, but we're talking about the future, not just next year. Um, 
So that, that was a, just a comment on expanding what the council saw because people understand that these are interrelated. Um, then the only other thing I had, Andy, when you talked about the finance report, I'd like maybe at the next meeting on the 23rd to make a decision whether we have a meeting on the uh, 28th <laughs> um, and the 30th, which we certainly cer currently have booked. I, we, I can't make the 30th at all, and I'm happy to help work on the report. So if we decide what the re report might look like, I would try to get a draft done by the 28th, which I can make. So just, you know, in terms of looking at our own schedules on- So the latest budget calendar did not have a meeting on the 30th. Okay, so that is now complete. So, we we, we yeah. had it as, so that's gone, that's great. But you will need the 28th because we'll wanna be, you'll wanna be talking about the orders, the actual actions you will be asked, or we're gonna recommend that you ask the council to take. Right, and I had that in, I still had that in for the, you know, three hours. You know, if we need three hours, we'll, we'll, we'll take three hours. My only, I have a constraint in that I really can't go past four that day. So. We'll uh, order the agenda appropriately so that we can. Uh... So uh, on this meeting of the 28th, which is, I just check again what day of the week it is. It's a Tuesday. Um, we will have a draft. Um, Kathy's going to be working on a draft, is that right, of the report? Well, I, um, no, Andy will be drafting. I just said I can help him work on it if we're working in that time space. If, if it goes much beyond that, I'm, okay. I'm, I've got an all-day meeting on the 30th. You know, I just, but, I'm not going to But be we do here. have to, we, I think we have to have the report for the meeting on the 28th because it's for the, we're going to present this to the town council on Monday the 3rd. And you're saying some people can't be here on the 30th, including you. Well, we don't have a meeting on the 30th, so right. I was just We don't have a meeting so. on the 30th. So the, the point of this was just to make sure we got our calendars and right. agendas straightened out. We, I probably will amend the agenda for the 23rd to say preliminary discussion of uh, report to council or something like that, just so that we can be more more freely talk about it because it's no, then not a housekeeping item. It'll actually be potential deliberation about the content of the report. Um, and uh, the 28th is when we're going to actually take, um, uh, be presented with what our, um, and this is just the wording that's used in the city form of government, the orders we are going to be recommending right. to, and we'll get, guidance from uh, uh, Paul and Sonia about that um, at that time, and then we'll discuss the draft of the report. So the draft orders are with our town attorney right now, reviewing them, and then we'll probably meet with the chair and vice chair to go through them to make sure that you're squared away with the approach that we're recommending before that meeting. Okay. I, I need to know how inclusive the, the report is our um, recommendations on all aspects of the budgets, the operating budget and the capital, or just the operating budget? We will cover um, operating and capital, but not CPAC, I think, because CPAC can really be treated as a uh, Community Preservation Act, can be treated as a separate item because it's not going to be dealt with at the same time. It's not a June 3rd item. Yes. I'm not going to be able to make it on the 21st. I teach in the evenings. I'm always available in the afternoons, but evenings I'm teaching. And even 28th, I'm traveling. So you cannot make it on either the 21st or 28th? No, not, not. not the 28th? Oh. So, so we would... Uh, if Lynn leaves by four, we'll have a forum until four, a quorum until four, correct? Yeah. No, you'll have Oh, no, a, Dorothy's here. Dorothy's here. Yes. We'll have a quorum. I mean, one option on the 28th would be to start an hour earlier if we could. That, w that works fine for me. The, my only uh, thing is rules, Lynn, and as you know, rules can go longer than one ever could imagine, but we start at 9.30, so we should, we should be finished by 1. I, I can come earlier because by that time, um, I don't have a class that day. 
So I could start an hour earlier on the 28th. That works for me. Yeah. And, Andy, uh, does that work for you? That works for me, and uh, but the goal is to be done by four yep. at the absolute yes. latest. So we, we just need to notify Amherst Media as well and, and okay. make sure we have this room available and things like that. So is, okay. that, what you're, is that what you're going to do? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, assuming that the facilities If, if you want to meet by 12 or 12.30, I mean, yeah. if you're no, worried think, about being I finished? No, I think that's fine because it's... No, that's too risky. We might not be done. So May 28th at 1 p.m. in this room. May 28th at 1. Got it. And we... We need to change the posting. Yep. And, uh, okay. So anything else people want to talk about with the, regarding the budget hearing at this point? Otherwise, I'm going to work with uh, Paul and Sonia and uh, Lynn about that in their other capa capacities. And uh, I will see most of you then. Thank you. Okay. So, Sandy, just to clear up on the, on the budget hearing, Paul's going to give a detailed report so that they feel that they know what's going on. There'll be a handout. People will or will not talk. If they ask questions, we would then be able to answer questions. Is that correct? Yes, this is a real hearing. It's a hearing. Yeah, okay. we, yeah. and then we make comments at the end. There's a whole sequence. Uh, actually, the charter has a very nice piece on hearings that'll describe it. But it is, it's a, more of a back and forth. It's a presentation, questions, comments, responses. But it, we don't have to have informal reports, do we? No, just no. comments, just answers no, to the actually questions. actually you don't want to because um, when we get to our final decision making, we should be considering comments we receive from the public. Otherwise, why would we have a hearing to ask for them? That's good. If they ask a question that we didn't delve into, though, we'll have Sonia here and Paul here. We aren't asking all of the department people to come back, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. I second. All in favor? So, we'll unanimous, uh, 420.